I'm going to invite Peter up. Um, and Peter's going to speak to us on confession. Um, and um, I'm going to pray for you, if that's okay. Please. And uh, Lord, we want to thank you so, so much for your word. Thank you for the Bible. Thank you for uh, the words of life that it speaks into us. And Lord, I pray for Peter as he shares with us now. I pray there'd be something of his words that would be that be kind of straight from your heart. There would be th- things that you want to say that cut right through to us, and no matter where we're at. I pray you bless him now. Bless us as we listen, and may we respond to you. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Ed. Um, I want us to begin by sharing um, in one of the most uh, profound prayers of confession that you can imagine. It's actually a psalm, Psalm 51. Um, I want us to share it in a very simple way, which is, um, I'll say the words in white type, (laughs) And you say the words in a sort of orangey yellow, yeah? And I've split it up, you know, because this is, um, this is a, a song, a poem. And the way uh, Hebrew poetry works is it repeats itself. The poetry that we may be used to repeats itself too. It repeats sound, doesn't it? It repeats the sound at the end of words. End of lines, rather. Um, But the way Hebrew poetry works, it repeats thought. So it says something, and then it says it again. But it it says it the second time in in a little more intensive way. It's a little bit stronger the second time. And I've split the psalm up to what we're going to share now to sort of show this. And you'll get it, I think. I mean, it's actually quite important to know that, I think. So whenever you read poetry in the Bible, uh, that's the way it works. It repeats itself, says something, and says it again, a bit stronger. So Psalm 51, it's a prayer of David, a psalm of David, when Nathan the prophet went to him after he had gone into Bathsheba. Next slide, please, sir, dear. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity, for I know my transgression. Against you, you only, have I sinned, so that you may be justified in your words. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity. Behold, you delight in truth, in the inward being. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Let me hear joy and gladness. Hide your face from my sins. Create in me a clean heart, O God. Cast me not away from your presence. Restore to me the joy of your salvation. Then will I teach transgressors your ways. Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God, O God of my salvation.
O oh Lord, open my lips. For you will not delight in sacrifice, or else I would give it. The sacrifice of God, the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit. Do good to Zion in your good pleasure. Then will you delight in right sacrifices, in burnt offerings and whole burnt offerings. Hmm. <laughs> Not a bull, you'll note, but a goldfish. I'll come back to him later. When I, when I was um, training for ministry many years ago, when we used to be pursued by uh, velociraptors and Tyrannosaurus rex on the way to the classroom... They used to say to us, our tutors, there's no point nowadays banging on about sin and guilt. Sin's a meaningless word nowadays for most people. They're not aware of it. Which I thought at the time begs the question, when were people always aware about sin? I mean, okay, yes, in the churches you'd hear a lot about it, but nah, most people just ignored it and got on with their lives. Always and forever. Nothing new about people not being aware of sin. And this here goldfish, could we have the goldfish back, please? What have you done with the goldfish, dear? I mean, he or, or she or whatever their preferred pronouns are, they don't know they're wet, do they? Until you take them out of the water, oh, then there's some awareness. Hmm? Now look, Psalm 51 has a backstory. We're told the backstory, aren't we? We've already had a summary of it when we read it together. And the backstory is this, just to remind us again. King David, who has already got lots of wives, decides he wants another one, but this one is married already to an officer in his army, Uriah. And Uriah's away fighting David's battles. But David sees the woman, lusts after her, takes her, makes her pregnant. Bathsheba is her name. And in the end, he decides the only way to cover up... Isn't it always the cover-ups are far worse than the sins, Yeah is to have Uriah killed. So he has him put in the most dangerous place in the battle line and he is killed. Um, that's a story, if you want to read about it, 2 Samuel 11. And, you know, David doesn't blink an eyelid. It's fine, yeah, okay, business as usual. But the thing he has done, we are told, is evil in the eyes of of the Lord. And the Lord sends his servant Nathan, the prophet. And Nathan tells David about this shocking injustice that Nathan has heard about, about this wicked, rich man who took a poor man's only lamb, so loved by the poor man it was like a pet slaughtered it and fed it to his guests. And David gets really hot under the collar. Who is this man, he says? I'll sort him out. And Nathan says to him, you're the man. You're the man. You took and you murdered and you covered up. 
And under the power of the prophetic word, under the power of the word, David is like a goldfish out of water. He's flapping around. Appalled, broken by the knowledge of what he's done. And this prayer, which we've shared, yes, it's a carefully constructed poem, but it's, it's full, actually, of raw emotion. I mean, it, it comes across better in the Hebrew. You know, have mercy upon me, O Lord, is... Have mercy upon me, it's... What, um, how many words is it? Four words and six syllables in English. In Hebrew, it's one word. Chaneni. Chaneni. It's like the cry of a wounded animal. Oh yes, he's, he knows now, does David. He's fully aware. I guess he's always thought of himself as a, a decent guy, you know? Oh yeah, I make a few mistakes, but oh, I'm on the side of the angels. Oh, man after God's own heart, they say about me. I'm okay. Now he's appalled at himself. At the way sin seems to have been in his life from its very beginning. In sin did my mother conceive me. By the way, we need to say here that there is nothing sinful about the act of conception. It may be undignified and a little bit comic, but it ain't sinful. Not in itself. David sees now that his life has always been touched by sin. And there's another insight. Yes, sins often involve hurting other people. But that we sin shows us that our lives are turned away from God. Against you, you only have I sinned. Every time we sin, we prove that we're not turned towards God, not listening to him. Under the word of the prophet, David doesn't just see the one episode. No, he sees for the first time how his whole life, back to its very beginning, has been inside a little dirty pool, far away from God. Not just my bad, not just my bad, but I'm bad. I'm bad. There's something in me which has turned away from God, who created me to be good, and in whose image I am. And yet I have broken that image and corrupted what he created good. And indeed, if we read the story of David in the books of Samuel, we can see this episode with Bathsheba and Uriah is not a one-off. David has form. People often die around David. And the deaths are very convenient, though it's never his fault. Nabal died. David and his gang of outlaws, on the run in the desert, had put the frighteners on Nabal. And when he wouldn't pay them protection, and when he finds out that his wife Abigail had been paying David off, Nabal has a stroke. He falls face downward in the gefilte fish and dies. Nothing to do with David. He didn't lay a finger on him. 
Though he gets Abigail as wife number two, or is it number three? I always lose count with David. Oh, and she's Nabal's heir, so he gets all Nabal's money. That's nice. Nice fault, of course. And what about uh, King Saul and Jonathan? Saul, David's king, his rival. Jonathan, his great friend. And they die together in battle against the Philistines. Tragic. David writes this most moving lament about them. Where was he and his band of by now formidable soldiers? Oh, actually, he was on the other side, elsewhere, but serving the Philistines. Oh, maybe things would have been different had David and his men been there. Very sad about Saul, Jonathan, he's gutted. And then they're out of the way. And Abner, Saul's last remaining general, who carries on the fight for Saul's house against David. And there's a peace of sorts at the end of the Civil War, but Joab, David's general, kills Abner in cold blood. David proclaims a day of national mourning for Abner, that good man. But he doesn't punish Joab. And it's very convenient that the last supporter of the house of Saul is out of the way. The judgment of Chronicles 28.3 on David is harsh but fair. David, we're told, is not worthy to build the temple of the Lord because he is a man of war who has shed blood. The humble shepherd boy about whom we sung under the pressure of power and the desire for it, the pressure of sex and the pressure of wealth has become somebody very different. And now he sees it. Now he sees it. We can ignore our sin, like David. We can go through life believing that, yeah, of course, nobody's perfect. We all make mistakes. But basically, we're the good guys. We're happy in our little bowl. Nothing's wrong with us, our normal way of being. So it is a mercy, a severe mercy, a gift. That, by the way, is what Nathan means. There might be some people here call Nathan. It means a gift. And that severe word is a gift to David, a strange paradoxical gift because it causes such pain. And we land flapping around, deeply troubled, seeing for the first time, perhaps, or maybe not the first time, needed to be reminded the reality of who we are. Owning it, begging to be delivered from it by the mercy of God, and we cry out, how could I have done these things, betrayed these people? Purge me, O oh God, in your great mercy. Wash me thoroughly. Chaneni. Chaneni. Hmm. Oh, what's the point? Will it bring back poor murdered Uriah? Restore his marriage? Will Bathsheba be given again her honor and dignity? Perhaps not. Part of true repentance is to make what amends we can for what we have done. But sometimes we can't, and the damage stays. Sin has its consequences. We have to live with the truth of it. Accept the brokenness of what can't be repaired until all things are made new. Yet David dares to hope that mercy will be shown to him 
that his broken heart will be mended, that others will learn from his story, that he will be restored to God's presence and worship again at his altars. And so it is. He is forgiven and restored. And as we reflect on the rest of his story, we may well believe that as his life is spared and he remains king for many years, as promises are made to him that his line will not fail and that one of his descendants will be the king, the son of David, who finally brings peace and healing and mercy to all of a broken, sinful world, we may well believe that he is taken from that little sinful pond, little bowl of sin, and dropped into the river of life. The great crystal stream that flows from the throne of a gracious God and of a lamb whose death on that cross brings healing and restoration to all who will swim in that river and be made clean. David learns to swim in the river of life and mercy that flows from the cross, that strange but glorious throne. We can tell that because having been shown mercy, David shows mercy to others. At the end of his reign, there is a great rebellion led by his son, Absalom. There is dreadful fighting and a dreadful war. But at the end of it, David is victorious. Though Absalom is killed in battle by, oh, guess who? Joab. And then voices are raised at the end of the rebellion. Let us settle those who betrayed you, Lord King. They are worthy of death. And David says, no. No one else need die. There has been enough death. He spares his enemies, he even mourns his son Absalom, who tried to kill him. Friends, Sinners like me. Sometimes God does deal with us in these dramatic ways. Takes us out of the bowl of sin. Shows us in, in ways which are very hard but merciful who we are. Perhaps at our conversion when we turn to him for the first time. More often it seems to me later in our journey with Christ. Sometimes he does it daily, <laughs> brings us slowly to that knowledge of who we are and how we stand every moment in need of mercy. We, he doesn't want us to be oppressed by a feeling of sin and guilt all the time. That, that's not it, no. But, but just to get real to understand what we can do and who, who we have become in our sin. But he sets before us Christ and the vision of what we could become in him. But how will we react today if God brings us out of the little bowl where we feel so comfortable and shows us something of the truth? What role does confession have in our prayers? Private <clears throat> and public. <laughs> Surely no service of worship can go by without an opportunity for people to get real with God. No prayer time be without that opportunity. 
Well, we've only got to say the Lord's Prayer. <laughs> forgive us our sins. As we forgive those who sin against us. And if we have known that mercy in our lives, how can we not extend it to others? Today. Is there someone today who needs from us a word of mercy and forgiveness? Haneni, have mercy upon me, O Lord, and upon all your people. Amen.